couple minutes late, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting of the Fullerton City Council uh, Successor Agency Public Financing Authority to order. Uh, City Clerk, could you read the roll? Mayor Fitzgerald. Here. Council Member Chapey. Here. Council Member Flory. Here. And I know the other two are, they're in the room somewhere. We'll count them as here. Great. Okay, thanks. If you could all join me for the invocation. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together as a community this evening and work to the benefit of all of our neighbors. Give us wisdom and help us treat each other the way we would like to be treated. In your name, amen. amen. And now, would you join me in pledging allegiance to our flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, City Attorney, is there a closed session report? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, there was direction given to staff and no reportable action was taken. Great, thanks. And now's the time for any ex parte communications. Does any, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on to our presentations. And I'd like to have our two new Fullerton police officers come up. Uh, to City Council so we can meet them. And I'm pleased uh, to start that off with the newest members of the Fullerton Police Department. And I want to, uh, we always want to recognize the men and women who make it their job to keep us safe. And with us tonight are our department's newest officers, Officer Tori Thayer and Officer Danielle Rydell. Is it Rydell or? It's Riedel. Riedel. I knew I would mispronounce it. So good. Do you want to just come up and uh, we're going to make you make comments. This is, this is the new generation of hazing, I guess. So please, Danielle. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Yeah. Um, I graduated from Modern Day High School in 2011, and then I went to Cal State Fullerton, and I graduated in 2015 with a degree in history. Um, I worked at Station 13, which is Cal State Fullerton PD, for four years while I went to school there as a community service officer. And then got hired here. That's great. We're so glad you're here. I'm Tori Thayer. I uh, graduated El Dorado High School in Placentia. Um, after graduation, I worked at Fullerton PD as a cadet for two years, so I worked the front desk. Um, shortly after, I went and worked at Irvine Police Department as a civilian investigator. Um, graduated from Cal State Fullerton in 2015. We actually graduated the same day together. Uh, my degree was in public administration, and um, a month after graduation, we got into the Orange County Sheriff's Academy, and we graduated January 14th of this year. And then, of course, what they didn't say was uh, at the academy, um, these two women were number one and number two um, among the women at the academy, and they were in the top ten of all of the people who went through the academy. So let's give them a round for that. Welcome and thank you so much for choosing Fullerton and for being willing to keep this community safe. We so appreciate it. Can we get a picture together? Just away from the gun. That's fine. And then we also get to celebrate some other local heroes tonight. Uh, and I'm going to have Fire Chief Wolfgang Kanabi come up. And he's going to tell you about a special award that we're going to give uh, to a few people this, af this afternoon, this evening, called the Lifesaver Award, Chief. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Members of the Council, it uh, gives me great pleasure this evening to present some uh, individuals here that have uh, done great service to our community. It's on, right? Okay. It's Great. just short because I'm short. <laughs> just, 
There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't want to make the mayor look bad. <laughs> okay. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, most people, they, uh, when the fire department or paramedics come, they don't really know what, what sets everything into motion. And uh, normally when you call 911, you get to you get to a 911 dispatch center, and then they transfer you to the fire department dispatch if it's a fire issue and they uh, PD PD issue. And so what happened? We're going to have well, one of our dispatchers here. We have some community members uh, or some staff from from Fullerton uh, that that assisted in this. And so I'm going to give you a little overview. It happened on February 2nd, 2016, at 0954 hours. Fullerton Engine One responded to 340 West Commonwealth Avenue, which is our our Fullerton Senior Center. Uh, for a reported unconscious person. So in route, they, uh, they went there for an unconscious person not knowing exactly what was going on. While in route, the call was upgraded to a full arrest. For those of you who don't know what a full arrest is, somebody's not breathing and they don't have a pulse. And traditionally, that's when the CPR is started. So it was upgraded to a full arrest. Upon arrival, Engine 1 found an elderly man on the floor with an AED attached. And I'm going to show you what an AED looks like. So in case something happens here tonight, you're in good hands. Uh, this is what uh, an automatic external defibrillator, AED, looks like, and this is what saved the life of this individual. So when somebody goes down into full arrest, obviously, the people that know CPR start CPR, The people that, and then they're also trained in AED. They'll go get the closest AED and put it on the person. So what happened, it was learned from the staff that the patient stopped breathing and became unconscious. The staff started CPR, quickly got the AED and applied it. When the AED, it tells you exactly what to do. The computer tells you what to do, puts on, and it tells you if it can shock or not shock. This individual went down, and there was a shockable rhythm, so the AED shocked that person, and by the time the fire department got there, the person had a pulse. The paramedics uh, then uh, did their paramedic intervention and uh, basically uh, took the person to the hospital. The person is alive today because of these individuals, and I'd like to bring them up explain to you what each of them did, and uh, just congratulate them afterwards. And uh, I think, uh, Madam Mayor, you have uh, council, uh, have council certificates, council certificates uh, for our firefighters, and then the fire department would like to give the non-firefighters a Lifesaver Award, which is one of the awards we give to community members or, or other than not fire department members that save lives. So uh, people I can acknowledge tonight are, uh, if please come up, uh, Paul Dominguez, who applied the AED. Paul, come on up, working for our community uh, services. Jerry Green, come on up, Jerry. And, and uh, he's a community volunteer, and uh, he applied compressions and assisted. Uh, and Christina Reese, uh, and she assisted with CPR. And uh, lastly, but just as important, is uh, Tracy Nolan, uh, from our Metronet dispatch, and uh, uh, Tracy, what she did was she was on the line uh, giving comfort, letting them know how to do CPR, and stayed on the line until it came to a good, good outcome. Um, we also have our firefighter and paramedics that responded. I'd like them to come up. Uh, paramedic Captain John Fugit. <laughs> Engineer Paramedic Dan Lancaster. And Firefighter Chris Tran. And we... We also had another firefighter there. He was unable to make it uh, tonight. Um, but I'd like to say, uh, Madam Mayor, without the actions of uh, all these people here, a life would be gone, and we would not have that person living. Last we heard, uh, the person uh, was uh, at the hospital with, with talking with the family and everything. So uh, these individuals here contributed to a life being saved, and it shows our EMS system from 911 to the dispatchers to community involvement, knowing CPR, knowing AED, our city family, and our, our firefighter paramedics working together to save lives. That's what it's all about, and that's why it's so important to, to present these people tonight.
Thank you. Madam Mayor, I'll feed this near us. Yeah, please. <laughs> Well, that is just a terrific story, like the chief said, of everybody coming together. So thanks again, everyone who played a part in saving that life. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on with our meeting now. We'll go to public comments. Uh, Ms. City Clerk, how many do we have? I have five speaker slips. Great. If you could come up yep. uh, and first speaker, please. And the other speakers, please line up on the wall behind me. Good evening, Barry Levinson, uh, Park and Rec Committee member and uh, longtime Fulton resident. Uh, the planning committee members voted last week for a temporary hold on College Town project until the below noted issues were addressed. They stated that there are major flaws with the project as currently proposed. They said that the traffic, congestion, pedestrian safety, increased air pollution, and the partial closure of Nutwood were all problems. Some said that the Cal State Fullerton has not been a good neighbor, especially as it pertains to the parking problems it causes to the surrounding residential neighborhoods. We, the public, learned that intersections, even after the mitigations would have occurred, would not be better than currently rated. Therefore, intersections would still be graded a D or an F after the mitigation efforts. It was also learned that the city's plan included donating for free the approximately 2.8 acres of land on Nutwood Avenue to the project. Going forward, we can expect that the city probably will remove the closure of Nutwood from the plan, maybe add a roundabout, and then try to pass College Town as they salivate over the $40 million in park dwelling fees. These changes, if approved, will not alter by much the very many problems already noted by the community and agreed with by the commissioners themselves. Therefore, this plan deserves to be terminated permanently for all the above reasons. Simply stated, it is all about the money. For starters, at $11,700 per residential unit, the park dwelling fee will generate almost $40 million to the city alone. It is clear that the city desperately needs to make up for this large budget deficits that already exist, which is $2.8 million, and which, and which have recently increased by millions of additional dollars in the form of large city employee raises, especially the 6% granted next year for police. All this is done without a confirmed source of where those millions of dollars are going to come from. The city council and our city manager are guilty of abandoning their fiduciary responsibilities to the citizens a Fullerton. It really is that simple. So we have exposed tonight a simple truth. The College Town Project is a terrible idea that has no community support but is being pushed hard by the city because the City Council, with the support of the City Manager, continue to spend money on themselves we simply do not have. They should be held all accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Fitzgerald. Mm. Good meeting. Good evening, Mayor Fitzgerald and members of the City Council. My name is Tony Package. Hi. Uh, nice time, Mr. Seaborn. My wife would love your pink scarf. No. Just totally, she would just, <laughs> oh, she's, if she's watching, she'd be jealous right now. Okay, my plan starting the first of the year was to start bombarding you with bees, right. figuratively. Mm -hmm but the water is just too big an issue to, to go away. Um, surprise. Uh, really bad November, December, January, and February doesn't look like it's going to be, it's going to be hot, not rainy. So what are we, what are we doing? Uh, you okayed December, in December 15th, $20,000 for interns to fight water wasters. Where are they at? That's my big question for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the council and Ms. Fitzgerald. My name is Joan Briano. I'm a candidate for Fullerton City Council. I also run the FullertonInformer.com website. 
Mr. Levinson touched on an issue that was brought before us not too long ago, and that was the ramming through of this ridiculous project that involved high-rise housing, closing off a freeway off-ramp and on-ramp. And really, it was unbelievable that this actually was criticized by the Planning Commission. I'm here tonight to call for the tendering of resignations of all the Planning Commissioners that voted for the Downtown Core and Corridor Special Project. I believe these people do not belong in their positions, and I believe they should either resign or be removed by the people that appointed them, because the DCCSP was passed without any objections in a Planning Commission hearing back in 2014. It is 10 times worse than this project called College Town, and it, it is unbelievable how we're this addicted to short-term cash to, so to solve long-term problems. This is all brought about by the state of affairs of the city's finances. And I don't care how bad the roads are in Los Angeles. I don't care how bad the roads are in, in parts of Santa Ana. I live in Fullerton, and there is no reason for this city to be in the condition that it's in in terms of its infrastructure, considering the tax base that it has enjoyed with the assessed value of these homes, with the average income and the sales tax revenue much higher that leave other cities salivating, why are we in such decay? And why are we so desperate to ram things through against the wishes of neighbors and residents behind their backs on, on hot summer evenings in, in the library room because the cameras don't work in here? To me, it's very suspicious. And I believe that there's a reason behind all of this aside from just the money. The uh, SCAG is heavily involved in dictating policy. They've infiltrated our planning commission. Mayan Johnson is a member of that, and I believe she probably had the most relevant diatribe insulting the residents that were there in opposition to that. And she is one of those people I'd like to see tender her resignation as well for the Planning Commission. The city does not want eight-story, ten-story high-rises with traffic from here to Kingdom Come. And I'd like to remind the, the people listening to me and the people on the dais that it may be the requirement of the city to have services provided to its residents, but it is not the requirement or the duty of the city to provide those services. We watched a million dollars go down the drain on this college town, and all of that was tax money. It may not have been our tax money, but it was somebody's tax money. So we spent a million dollars trying to cook this thing up and ram it through, and it needs to go back into the trash can. And I don't want to see this DCCSP brought back until that thing's been fully vetted and we have these people removed from their positions. I really do believe that this is a monster and it will be defeated, and shame on any of you that vote for it if it does try to get snuck in. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you, Madam Mayor Fitzgerald and honorable council members. My name is Ryan Reza Farsai. I'm one of the partners and current operator of the ARCO Fullerton at 519 South, South Harbor Boulevard. <coughs> I'm here this evening to speak to you as a concerned citizen of the state of California. Here to present some facts, some actual numbers. So, uh, as as you know, I'm a, my family's been an owner and operator of gas stations for over 20 years, 30 years for my father. Uh, in 2008, summer of 2008, the price of the barrel hit $147 a barrel. The street prices hit $5 in California. I would consider that as inflated prices. Today, the price is under $30 a barrel. Correct. Uh, pricing today was 29.23 at 42 dollar 42 gallons per barrel. That's 69.69 cents or 70 cents. So today's 30 dollars should have been a dollar street price. Let's say a dollar in 2008 with three percent inflation. We're looking at a dollar 27 to dollar 30 today. So uh, what is the average Californian paying for gas today? Dollar 80, dollar 90 two something, three dollars in LA. These are inflated prices, ladies and gentlemen. So a gallon that costs 69, 70 cents after additives is sold unbranded for a dollar this morning. It's sold to me in Fullerton for a dollar 47 and San Clemente for a dollar 78. This is zoning at a state level by my partner Tesoro. So th they think it's fair for someone in Mission Viejo or San Clemente, for instance, to pay 28 cents more per gallon for the same product. Now, you think that's bad for the county level. Well, let's look at it at the state level. I happen to go to Louisiana every year for the last 10 years. On December 26, 
I got gas in my rental car for a dollar fifty eight in Louisiana. I came home. I'm selling the gas in California for three nineteen at my gas station. Historically, this has been about fifteen to twenty percent spread in the last ten years when I go there. Two twenty here, dollar eighty there. Two fifty nine here, two twenty nine there. Now it's a hundred percent. So what's happening there? So what is our recourse as citizens? How do we protect Californians? I like to spend time educating my fellow honorable elected officials about the truth as I see the issue of zoning or divide and conquer strategy by my partner Tesoro. Today, I'm making 40 cents. The Costco is also making 40 cents plus, and he's selling the gas 50 cents cheaper than me. In a few months, he's going to go from taking American Express to Visa. So he's going to take more of my business. So I'm here to just uh, let you know about that, and hopefully in the future you'll, we'll be coming up for some uh, more CUPs to help our cause to uh, survive in this economy. And thank you for uh, your time and consideration. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Next speaker. Oh, good evening. Uh, Sean Payton. I also wanted to touch on the college town vote on the Planning Commission on Wednesday. Uh, if you heard or if you followed, but uh, a, a clear majority of the Planning Commission expressed serious reservations about the college town proposal. Uh, five of the members were on record opposing the closing of Nutwood. Another five were on record opposing the creation of a parking district. And another four were on record for opposing a zoning change in two of the seven uh, districts that were affected within the College Town plan. The reason I'm up here is that when the matter was set for the Planning Commission on February 10th, uh, the City Council was scheduled to vote on the matter on March 15th. The Planning Commission voted to continue the hearing to a date uncertain. There was no specific date set. So I'd like to take this opportunity to confirm from Mr. Feltz that uh, that March 15th hearing will go off and that the City Council will defer on any further action in College Town until after it's gone back to the Planning Commission and they've taken a look, sorry, taken a look at it a second time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Fitzgerald, members of City Council. I'm Teresa Harvey, President and CEO of the North Orange County Chamber of Commerce. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank the mayor for participating in our upcoming State of the City, which we held on Friday, April 15th at Cal State Fullerton in the Titan Student Union at 1130. It will be a luncheon. Um, and as our featured speaker, the mayor will be able to present her vision for the city of Fullerton, what it's doing to continue to celebrate the excellence that is happening in our community, and for us as a business community to really hear the communities, the city's plans for developing business and encouraging business to flourish in our community. So I just wanted to invite all of you again and to thank the mayor for her participation. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Are there any other speakers under public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back for council staff communications. Mr. City Manager, was there anything you needed to respond to? Yes, uh, request a poll item number two and item number seven okay. and uh, confirm the College Town uh, proposal uh, was directed by the Planning Commission to uh, return. Uh, there was no date set. Okay, great. Great, thanks. Council Member Chafee, do you have uh, any council staff communications this evening? Uh, I'd like to ask City Manager a question. And what is the status of uh, Drip Coffee? Our understanding is they will be open next week. Uh, they are planning, a, uh, I think, a soft opening. They're trained, but we do have word that they completed their final health department permit. So that was the uh, the key missing piece of this. So it should be open next week. I look forward to that. Uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, my wife and I attended the YWCA chocolate fantasy, uh, particularly uh, naming Marty Burbank. Uh, man of the Year, and Marlene McGlency, Woman of the Year. Uh, if you like chocolate, I mean, you were OD'd on that. It was really a, a great thing. Uh, we also attended an incredible tribute to Jim Young, called Young at Heart, at the, uh, at the Cal State, uh, featuring readings of his poetry, which were greatly insightful about life, uh, including a lot of his uh, love for his wife, and a number of uh, very romantic letters. Uh, along with the appropriate uh, band that, pl uh, orchestra, I should say, that played. So it was a beautiful event. That's my report, Mayor. Great, thank you. Councilmember Seaborn? 
Yeah, it looks like uh, Airport Days is finally getting out the uh, postcard. So Airport Day 2016 is Saturday, May 7th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Make sure you mark your calendar. I also hear uh, earlier that morning is the Eye Cure Melanoma 5K run, and uh, maybe I'll see you at both those. Great. Councilmember Whitaker? I want to request uh, to pull item number 7 and item number 8 on okay. the consent calendar. All right. And I was pleased to see today that uh, construction appears to be moving along uh, on the Juanita Cook uh, bicycle trail and uh, near Bassentury. And I was wondering, since the signs posted now show it's about three months since that portion of the trail has been closed, if we could get an idea on a completion of that project. Juanita Cook uh, Trail near um, Baston Tree. Mm -hmm. It's the one where we've had some accidents with people going down the hill. So that I'd like an answer to. The second thing is I need to call attention <coughs> to an unfortunate uh, event, the recent discovery of embezzlement by a Fullerton Rangers official. And it just underscores the need for us to encourage citizen oversight and participation in all these activities. I say this as a member of a council that recently voted down creation of a volunteer audit committee, which would be an extension of this council to allow the councils to stay more on top of complex financial but other procedural issues in the city. So I think we need more transparency and more eyes watching what's going on in city government, and not less. Mem Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Flory. Uh, I have a question about number four, so I'd like to pull that just for a quick question. Uh, on Friday, uh, myself and Dave Schickling from our water department and Joe Fells, our city manager, and Pete Beard, our Metropolitan Water District Board representative, took a tour of the Carlsbad desalinization plant very, very educational. Um, I will say that I have, have been, up to this point, an opponent of desalinization. The situation in San Diego County is quite different than our situation in Orange County, where we are blessed with a groundwater aquifer where we can store water. And my concern with the desalinization plant in Huntington Beach has always been the two questions that must be answered, who benefits and who's going to pay for it. And those questions have not been answered to my satisfaction yet. But as far as the operation of the plant is concerned, the environmental issues that have been raised up to this point, as well as uh, issues having to do with noise attenuation, all of that was put to rest. And I would strongly encourage anybody who wants to tour the Carlsbad plant to contact me and I will put a tour together with the appropriate representatives for you to see for yourself what it looks like. It is uh, in size and scope, it's about the same size as the uh, plant proposed for Huntington Beach. And the reason it is of concern to us in Fullerton is that that water is going to cost significantly more than the water that we pump from the groundwater basin. So I think it's important for us because of those regional implications to keep uh, tabs on that situation. I'm also going to inform my council that when this comes up for a vote, I want a presentation made to the city council so that our city council members can vote on how they want me to vote. The reason that my situation is a bit different from the other board members, we are a 10 member board and seven of those members are elected, whereas three of the members, myself, City of Anaheim, and the City of Santa Ana, are appointed. And I want to make sure that I have the support of my council when I cast a vote for this Huntington Beach desal plant this next year. Great, thank you. I wanted to uh, remind the community that uh, Love Fullerton is coming up on April 30th. 
So you can sign up to uh, make donations uh, to help with the projects. You can sign up to work on any of the community service uh, projects that we have going on. It's a citywide serve day on April 30th. So we do everything uh, through Love Fullerton, like um, rehabbing parks, painting inside school classrooms, uh, helping nonprofits and uh, communities of faith fix up their properties. Uh, there are people who uh, get to play with kids or bake cookies with um, women in uh, homeless shelters. There are all kinds of projects that you can get involved in. And so I would just encourage you um, to bring your whole family out. Um, there are great kid-friendly projects, family-friendly projects. Um, it's just a great day to love on our city. And we're so excited uh, that this year the other communities in North Orange County are also doing uh, citywide serve days on April 30th. So from Anaheim to Placentia up through La Habra and Brea, um, everyone will be out in their community in mass, uh, really giving back to their community and investing in it. And then I also wanted to um, thank our police department for its great work that led to the arrest of the um, former treasurer of the Fullerton Rangers uh, who uh, embezzled money um, from, our, from our parents. And I want to thank you for everything that you did uh, to help bring justice to that situation. And I wanted to thank our Parks and Rec Director and our City Manager. Um, and Hugo, if you'll pass along also to John Clemens and Carol Whitaker, um, our thanks for holding uh, the Fullerton Rangers accountable to uh, all of the non-compliant issues that, that you found that they had. You know, we have a lot of nonprofit sports league partners in this town um, that provide great services to our families. Um, many of you, your kids have probably played little league and soccer. And we, uh, as a city, uh, we give a lot of preference to our nonprofit partners. And we're so thankful for all those parents that come out and volunteer and make up those sports leagues. And of course, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that too. So uh, when we find that there are sports leagues that aren't acting in accordance with uh, the city rules that are set up to protect the taxpayer investments in our parks and in our sports fields, then it's our duty to make sure that uh, they come up to compliance and act as good partners. I'm really encouraged by the actions that the Rangers board has uh, taken over the last couple weeks um, to assure us that they are going to come up to compliance on all of those issues. And I know we at the city stand ready to help them do that. So Hugo, again, thanks for all your work on that. We'll go ahead and move into appointments. Councilman Whitaker, I think you have an appointment uh, to the Transportation Circulation Commission. I do, and I select uh, Sean Payden as my appointee. Okay. Great. I move to ratify the appointment. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, that passes. We'll go ahead and go to the consent calendar. Items 2, 4, 7 and 8 have been pulled. Does a council member need to pull any other items? I'll move the balance. Okay. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. We'll go back to item number 2. And uh, Mr. Curley, I believe you pulled this item. Good evening. My name is David Curley. Uh, this isn't the first time I've uh, pulled these up for you guys to look at. Uh, unfortunately, again, there's more luxury hotels being stayed at by members of the police department. There was an explanation given that it's not city money, and therefore it's not really a problem. Um, I, I disagree with that. I, I think it sends a very bad message to um, the residents of Fullerton that somehow, by being a city employee, that you should be entitled to uh, luxury accommodations. So you see this item here, uh, Westgate Hotel Company. I'm going to go down and show you. Um, this is the kind of amenities they offer. Imported European furniture, luxurious linens, plush bathrobes and slippers, oversized marble shower, oversized work desk, three telephones, two separate telephone lines. It's just, it's really excessive for, for what is necessary. It's, and the, the room rates, that 188 is if you buy in advance, they really start at about 200 and go up to several hundred dollars more. I, I mean, this is just really 
not uh, really not impressive. I mean, looking at how they function, and again, Hyatt Regency, another sixteen hundred bucks in in hotel expenses. I'm seeing thirteen dollars and ninety cents. Eight thirteen. Eight thirteen. Where? At the top. Oh, okay. I see. And I want to draw your attention to one more item. You guys had the League of California Cities decision on hold until the last meeting, and despite uh, your instructions to have that on hold, they still sent them more money at the end of January. I, I don't know why. Um, I think it would be very good if the council would ask Mr. Fells to explain all of these things and why, and why they're acceptable, really. I mean, the, the fancy hotels, the, I mean, I could have put more uh, check register items up, but I decided not to. I mean, there's, there's a lot more, but it, it's just every month there's just more and more of this stuff, and it would be nice if there, were, there would be some explanations given, anything. So with that, thank you for listening. Thank you. Are there any uh, other speakers on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. We'll move the item be received and filed. I have one related question. I'm sorry, there's been a motion. Is there a second? Well, there was to a second. Oh, to receive and file receive on number two. The item. Yes, I'll second it. Okay, and now, Councilman Whitaker. I have a related question from the last meeting where uh, there was an item for $28,000 for MODOC, and I was assured that uh, someone would find an answer on that. I've got an answer for that because I asked three people that question. We are not a member of MODOC because we buy Metropolitan Water District uh, water directly from the uh, MWD. However, there are certain educational functions that are required by the state that MODOC undertakes. And the biggest, the lion's share of that $28,000 was for the purpose of MODOC to come into Fullerton classrooms and educate students in our school district about water conservation. So that amounted to about 18000 of the total amount, and another 10000 was related to the Children's fest Festival and the educational um, benefits for the, the Children's Water festival, that, festival that's held annually. Alternatively, if we didn't give MODOC a pro rata share, we would be required to hire water conservation experts to come into our schools, and a decision was made long ago that it was much more cost-effective to participate with MODOC in that pro process. Well, I have a question about that. Um, MODOC is a public agency, and it would seem to me that uh, for the public benefit and for the goals that MODOC and also the OCWD would share, that they would provide such instruction at, at uh, public service. Uh, I'm wondering who is actually being paid for this. These aren't MODOC employees, staffers, are they? I, uh, that I don't know because I was talking to Mike Marcus, our general manager of OCWD, and also to, um, oh, who was the second person I talked to, Bill Hunt, about that as well. well. When I was a member of OCWD, I would frequently even accompany OCWD top staffers who would go out and attend public meetings at no charge to any entity involved. Sometimes those were at schools as well. So I'm just wondering who is getting this cost recapture? Where is that going? I'll find uh, that out for you. Right. I mean, if, th if this is indirectly hiring some contractor mm -hmm. to carry this out, then I would have concerns about it. Um, these are the type functions, again, that are so consistent with the agendas of these public agencies that to charge uh, is astounding to me. It is. Well, well, what will really knock your socks off is they have just remodeled the hallway at OCWD in, in, in partnership with the Discovery Science Center, and they're spending over a million dollars to do that. It's just mind-boggling, because what I'm trying to get is video streaming of our board meetings at a cost of about $54,000, and it, I can't seem to get that done. I just want to thank uh, Mr. Curley again for calling attention to that item, and I would like to pursue and obtain the detail just who this money is being, uh, who's being compensated by these, by these fees. 
Great. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, that passes. We'll move to item number four. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Flory, I believe you pulled this? Yes. I simply had a question. The monies that are being allocated here are for the uh, repair of bathrooms that were damaged in 2012 when a large eucalyptus tree fell onto the restrooms at Gilmar, Gilman Park. What took so long to get the insurance payoff and to get this going? This three well, years? We had, we had insurance adjusters come out and, and evaluate it um, shortly after that. We, we did wait a little while because we did, have, we did have Gilman Park improvements on our capital improvements project list. And so mm -hmm. we thought if we were going to do something, we would do it all together, knowing that that time wasn't going to happen. Then we just finally moved forward. And what we actually did there was the, the restrooms were pretty much in um, uh, bad conditions. And so what they're doing right now is they're repairing the actual service room, which is where all the irrigation controllers and a lot of the service controls are located. And they're basically, they're able to make a break off from what, what was destroyed and restore the actual maintenance shed. So it'll look a lot nicer and it'll be safe. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I move that we approve the budget transfer to Project 54019 for the Gilman Park improvements. Okay. Is there a second? Is, is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any uh, member of the public that would like to comment on this? Seeing none, uh, we'll bring it back to council. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? That passes, we'll go to item number seven. Mr. City Manager, I believe you said someone had pulled this and I know Councilman Whitaker wanted to pull it as well. Was that a member of the public? Okay, um, let's go ahead, uh, Mr. Curley, I guess that's you. Okay. Same file. Uh, David Curley, uh, Fullerton resident. Um, I'm going to draw some attention to this item again. Um, one, on the second page of the agenda letter, let's see. There's a comment here at the bottom that says it, to fund the additional officers, uh, funds in the range of 150 to 200K could be realized. Um, where are these numbers coming from, considering this hasn't been discussed at all? Uh, in fact, the first discussion is later in this meeting. So, so where do these numbers come from? Is this um, being discussed behind closed doors? I hope not. But it makes you wonder where these numbers just, just come out of nowhere. Um, a big justification for the hiring uh, of new officers was to help the downtown area and um, the homeless, um, various things. And I, I understand that. Um, last week, the police department formed a social media team, which I, I, I'm not criticizing. I think it's a good idea to disseminate information to uh, the public. So they engage residents on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, but th this is where I'm really confused about, about this. If we're short on officers to staff uh, the downtown area, uh, how could we have two more sworn officers to join the social media team? I mean, if we're that strapped for, for uh, police officers, I don't know how there's time uh, in, their, in their daily work schedules to respond to social media requests. I would think that would be best done by the non-sworn uh, personnel or maybe the cadets. I'm sure uh, teenagers, college students, they're very uh, proficient with social media. And then you could uh, allow those officers to, um, I guess, do what they normally do, patrol or whatever. Um, there's something else here, just as an aside, uh, that, that's sort of concerning, and I would just encourage uh, encourage Chief Hughes, uh, don't don't worry about the department's reputation. Um, the, the comment up here is that their ability to send out a proper message. Well, wouldn't you just want to tell the truth to the public, and not? I don't know what proper message means. And then there's a comment about branding. That's something you'd hear in the corporate world. Um, I, I don't know why it comes up here. Um, and at the end, looking to do some creative things on Instagram, mugshot Mondays, Warner Wednesdays, Felon Fridays. 
I mean, that, that almost enters the realm of entertainment value than anything useful. So I would say just do a good job. That's all you have to do, and you'll win people over in no time. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public speakers on this? We'll go ahead and bring it back to council. Um, Mr. Whitaker, did you want to lead off? Yes, I had a few questions. Um, the bullet points which have been indicated where uh, funding would uh, be derived for this item, uh, overtime savings, police department overtime savings, it says 200000 from the million-dollar annual current overtime. Uh, <coughs> increased property tax revenue, I, I get that. But the... Um, the housing fund reimbursement for general funds used for the homeless shelter, a, a rebate of that money, which is $500,000. Over five years, it's anticipated 100000 What happens after five years with the necessary revenue from that segment? And I'll, I'll go ahead and ask my second question. Um, perhaps city manager can fill me in on it. Downtown area parking fees, I t agree with the speaker that... Uh, that there's been no determination on this at all. We'll discuss something later in this meeting. But in that uh, agenda packet on the item later, it indicated that the plumber parking structure was the only one currently that charges for parking in the downtown area. But I didn't see any information on the amount of revenue currently that's derived from plumber. So as this is structured, I would assume that uh, right now downtown area parking fees would come from plumber. I'd be interested in knowing what the annual revenue is on the plumber structure and then what the net revenue is. Great. Mr. City Manager, you want to address those before we move on? Uh, yes, we were asked to give a, a funding profile and, uh, looking into the future uh, about 2017. So that's what you see the bullet points here. I think the key word for the downtown parking fees is could. Um, Certainly, this is going to be an item before you that uh, merits a lot of discussion, uh, but that is not the plumber parking uh, fees. That's done by contract. I don't know the annual income, but the, the Fullerton College uh, has the management and then uh, essentially leases a portion of it from the city. Uh, but this is uh, really to give a snapshot of moving forward what could be some funding sources for additional police officers. We certainly focused on the, the two or three uh, that were the most likely, and that's the overtime savings, the reimbursement from the from the housing fund, as well as the uh, uh, analysis that our consultant did on the new uh, housing and other projects that are going to increase the assessed value in a number of properties. And that's what uh, he uh, came in the figure of the $450,000 a year beginning in 1718. Yeah, what I'm seeing here is without the assumption of any kind of parking fees, you have $750,000 estimated uh, revenue to $600,000 expense. Is that what that, you intend? That's to correct. Uh, all of this will be at the discretion of the city council when we bring forward your future budgets. Right. Okay. Thank you. Are there other comments on this? Well, just one question. Is there any member of staff here who knows what the annual revenue is from plumber parking structure? Mr. Hoppy, I don't believe there. Uh, maybe Julia, do you have a, an idea on that? The city doesn't actually net any revenue from the plumber parking. Right. Um, the Fullerton College, as the city manager said, um, collects all the revenue. Uh, the city maintains that structure. Right. At a, uh, about a cost of about thirty thousand a year, and then Fullerton College reimburses us for that cost. So we really don't make any money off of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Are there other council comments, uh, motions? I'll move the recommendation. My reading of this agenda letter is we had asked staff to discuss the possibilities. <laughs> Uh, it is my understanding that as each of these possibilities arises, our council will be. Uh, approving or disapproving different funding mechanisms, so I'm very comfortable with this. The, um, the expert who evaluated our police staffing recommended that we hire 14 new officers, and instead this uh, council took the recommendation of our chief to do a more conservative approach and to begin with hiring five new officers, which is anticipated will take about a year. Uh, a year down the road, we'll have a better idea of how we're supposed to do it, but one of the chief 
responsibilities of city government is to secure the safety of our citizens, and I think this is a good step towards that, so I support it. And I'll go ahead and second it and just say that um, the funding that has already been identified uh, and is, you know, already uh, in the works is $750,000 a year to $600,000 in expense that we'll incur annually. And so I'm comfortable at this time approving this as well. Are there other comments? I have a question. We were introduced to two uh, terrific young officers uh, this evening. Is that part of the five, or are we talking about five more? No, sir, that is not part of the five. Okay, uh, thank you. Those are ones who have graduated the academy and are currently in their field training officer program. Thank you for hiring them. That's a good hire. Other comments? If not, we'll go ahead and take a vote on it. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. We'll go ahead and move on to item number eight. I'm not sure who pulled this item. I did. Okay. I pulled this item because I note within it, it indicates that uh, the project was predicated on receipt of 9% federal tax credits to make uh, the project pencil out. They haven't received those. They've reapplied, and that should be determined again uh, next month in March, according to the agenda materials. My concern, again, is, uh, well, as I stated back when this was being discussed, so I pulled it merely to register my no vote. Okay. Are there other comments or motions? Well, I'd, I'd like to say this is an unusually well-designed project. Are, one you, that are you on? Oh. Not, this yeah. isn't coming. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Now, this is an unusually well-designed project. Uh, I went up to Sacramento at the hearing for the 9% credits. This was the highest scoring project in Orange County. But the way the rules read then is there were quotas for different kinds of projects. And because the quota for a special needs project had already been met, two lower scoring projects were funded in its place. Uh, now those rules have changed. There's an additional allotment for special needs projects. And I think this time it will succeed very nicely. Thanks. Are there any other comments? Okay. We'll, uh, let's see, and I kind of lost track. Did we have a motion? I'll, I'll, I'll move the recommendation. Okay. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think that takes us to the end of our consent calendar, and we'll go to our first regular business item. And I think uh, the chair of our Economic Development Commission, Gary Graves, is here, and it uh, will lead us on this discussion with a presentation. We do have a PowerPoint um, that I can lead us through, but um, maybe I'll just make a statement uh, ahead of time if that's okay. Okay. All right. Sure. So, good evening, Mayor Fitzgerald and Council, Council Members. My name is Gary Graves. I'm a resident, a business owner, and educator in our city, as well as the Chairman of the Economic Development Commission, serving alongside a dedicated group of Fullerton citizens, business owners, and professionals. As you know, our Commission is responsible for making recommendations and implementing the economic development policies of our general plan. Since our first meeting in January 2014, our goal is to make Fullerton a more business and citizen friendly and, a, and a, truly to be a great place to live, learn, work, shop, and play. Fullerton is fortunate to have a uniquely positioned advisory commission such as the EDC, and we are excited to be here tonight to share with the council some topics we've been working on. We are also looking forward to coming back in April to present our findings and recommendations for updating the city's film and photography program. We think the council will be pleased with some of our ideas for increased efficiency, improved customer service, and increased economic activity on this topic. Tonight, our recommendations will help to encourage more businesses to improve their permanent signage by temporarily waiving the sign permit fee. Businesses will be encouraged to create beautiful signage such as the sign you may have seen recently at Fullerton Photographics on the corner of Berkeley and Harbor. The minor, excuse me, the minor site plan application fee waiver will also encourage more businesses to set up shop in Fullerton for such entities, tra trade school, such small trade schools such as the arts, tutoring, dance, and others. Lastly, working with the Community Development Department, we want to 
see the cities cities seriously consider bringing back the accelerated building plan check option, which will enhance our customer service at the city hall and give businesses and others an option to speed up the process for their building plan checks. We've worked with the departments that are affected by our recommendations to minimize unintended consequences. Through our collaboration with staff, the EDC is confident that the recommended service option fee waivers will will help to attract new business and improve our customer service at City Hall. Others from the Commission are here tonight, along with our Commission Liaison, Nicole Bernard, to help answer any questions you might have about, about our recommendations. Thank you for your time tonight. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Graves, so much. I, am, am, I want to thank you, too, for your service, you and the whole Commission, uh, and bringing to us uh, what amounts to a great deal of work and thought that you've all put into into this project. And I'm, I'm really impressed how you seem to have your your finger on the pulse of the local business community. And uh, I think, I, I mean, I agree with you that I think these three items that you outline are really going to encourage these small businesses. So thanks so much for your work. Do other council members have questions of Mr. Graves? I do, just one. Uh, and this maybe is a question that you can't answer, but in our resolution, the third recommendation to accelerate the uh, plan check option is not included in the resolution what was the reason for that do you know i'm sorry nicole why don't nicole bernard um why don't you come on up so everyone can hear your explanation thank you nicole bernard assistant to the city manager economic development manager we didn't need to include um, the addition of the building plan check option in the resolution because that isn't something that's already set by resolution Okay. The fees are existing, but we're not proposing any change to those. Can you in the back hear the people that are speaking at the at the mic here? You can. Okay, thank you. It just sounds low tonight. It just yeah, sounds really reason. low, yeah. yeah. But so, Nicole, um, so just for further clarification, then that is something that can be changed at the policy level, not, th not with a resolution not needed. Correct. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Not a question. I think it's probably directed to uh, Director Hoppy or maybe um, uh, Director Haluza. When it comes to uh, expediting plan checks and that sort of thing, uh, do we bring in uh, consultants that the whoever the applicant is um, that are paid for through those fees, or does it pay for staff overtime, or how does that work? If we have the same staff and we're putting somebody else's project in front of someone else's, then it it kind of has a rip, uh, ripple effect. Depending on the complexity of the project, we either do handle it with in-house staff or if it's more complex or lends itself to it, we have a contract plan check service that we use. And does it in any way affect the other applicants on their regular schedule? No, it wouldn't affect any on the so regular schedule. So if we had schedule. 20 projects come in all at the same time, 10 of them want it expedited, the other 10 don't take the back seat? They don't. We would send okay. the expedited to our contract firm. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Graves, uh, with these fee waivers and this expedited plan check, did your commission talk about how uh, the city should publicize this opportunity? Um, we didn't go into great detail, but, um, you know, our partnership with the chamber, other business associations, um, you know, and there's right now the city has a great deal of, of social media out there. So um, it, it should be pretty easy for us to get the word out once, this, once you approve it tonight. Okay, great. Thanks. Are there other questions? Okay, seeing none, um, does any member of the public wish to comment on this item? Good evening, Council. It's Jane Rance. I was just curious, um, there's a committee to help with economic development and move these processes through to make this easier for businesses. Of course, we want to encourage new businesses and support them. But is there any committee that, as homeowners, we can go to to ask for the same, this same kind of help and advocacy before the council waiver, for waivers to fees? For instance, I live in a historic home. It's born, built in 1924, and it had been retrofitted with plastic windows. Well, some people call them vinyl, but they were hideous. So um, I replaced them with custom-built double sash, double pane, uh, wood windows. And the, they were very costly, but on top of that, the fees here in the city for um, installing, for your permits for your windows, those are considered um, a, uh, a uh, new construction, I believe, when you put in the proper windows. 
um, we were charged at a percentage of the cost of the windows. So the better the window I put in, the more I was charged for my permit fees. And I don't know what board to take that to to ask for a revision to that, that fee policy. Oh, I can't remember, $400 for three windows or something like that. Because these windows were like $800 to $1,000 a window. Or the smaller ones were 500 Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who'd like to address this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Uh, do I have a motion? Move it. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Great, seeing none, we'll go ahead and call the vote. Again, EDC, I really want to thank you for working on this. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Great, thanks so much. We'll go ahead and move to item number 10. And uh, Planning Director Karen Haluza, I believe you wanted to make some introductory comments. I'm sorry, item 11, what did I say? I've only had half a cup of coffee. All right. Yes, I wanted to provide a presentation tonight on the results of the study that we recently completed, a phase one existing conditions report to look at a potential for a downtown Fullerton parking management strategic plan. And I'd first like to say thank you very much to the City Council for uh, authorizing us to do this study. Providing for parking for planners is one of, if not the most important factors in the design and function of land use and how places work. Essentially, once you figure out what you're going to do with the cars, whatever's left over is what you get to use for anything else. So understanding parking, especially in a historic business district that we have in downtown Fullerton, is really essential to understanding how that place works at all. It's much more than just figuring out um, where to store your cars. So we really appreciate this opportunity. The reason that we're here tonight are several. Um, one is that, as one of the speakers noted, the downtown core and corridor specific plan has not been adopted. And it had two implementation measures having to do with downtown parking management and a potential business improvement district. And because we uh, have been asked to look at potential ways to uh, generate revenue, potentially through downtown parking fees, and also because the city council asked us to renew looking at a potential business improvement district, we went uh, about putting together this study. The purpose of the study of the report is to really look at a, a comprehensive assessment of the existing conditions in downtown Fullerton. And it's not meant, this is not meant as a criticism of the way that anything is being done right now or any of the uh, efforts of the staff. Everyone is doing a great job with the part of the system that they oversee. But it really is meant to be a very clear-eyed look at what is existing in downtown Fullerton right now as it regards parking. And we want to do this in order to establish a foundation that the council can use in making potential policy changes and policy decisions uh, that address the role of parking and parking management in the downtown. And beyond just looking at a supply and demand analysis, which is what we typically do, but really looking at this from a strategic standpoint standpoint about how does managing our parking resource downtown f affect the way downtown functions from an economic standpoint, from the way employees operate, transit riders, visitors, and so on. And then finally, we would like to receive direction from the council to begin the phase two of this uh, work, which would be an implementation framework. And there's really no way you can go about um, talking about or affecting changes to parking that uh, would not require an extensive amount of community outreach. So that was another reason why tonight we aren't, pro we aren't providing you with any recommendations of what to do next uh, because that has not yet occurred. And so that's why we went about first of all doing this detailed existing conditions analysis. So in order to do that, we started way at the beginning. I always like to say, tell the story and start with once upon a time. So we went back to 1887 which was when the town site of Fullerton map was first drawn and it identified a central business district and that was uh, along Spadra which is now Harbor between Whiting and Santa Fe and so that's essentially what we have today so even though the footprint of our central business district our historic downtown hasn't changed since 1887 the way we use it has changed the way we get there has changed the population of Fullerton and the region has increased exponentially. Um, it's, it's a very different place than it was when we used to get there with uh, 
carts and horses and buggies. And so, but we still have that same geographic area that we're dealing with. And we started looking at, or other organizations did in 1923, starting to canvas, starting to survey what were people's ideas and opinions about parking downtown. And I say that because we've been studying it since then. And the issues really haven't changed, and the findings of the studies often haven't changed. So in 1923, the concern was employees parking on Harbor Boulevard, and that made too much congestion. So how could we plan better for employee parking? Um, in 1950, the, the idea was we don't have enough parking downtown, so the city started purchasing land and building new parking. And then up to through 2012 when the SoCo parking structure was opened, and that's, that was the really last big public improvement as it related to parking. That was not funded by the city but through um, Amtrak and OCTA. <laughs> So the scope of this study was to survey prior parking studies and then also look at any studies or proposals that were in progress to investigate any prior planning efforts, plans that might have been adopted that could affect parking, such as the Fullerton Transportation Center specific plan. Then we looked at the physical structures themselves, the existing parking lots, their, their um, striping, their signs. We looked at the use of parking technology that we currently have. We went about looking at all of the different ways that our systems are administered and managed here at the city and identified each department that had a piece of that and who that was and how that functioned. Then we did a detailed parking, public parking inventory and a private parking inventory as well. We worked with the engineering firm of Fair and Peers. They're um, a, an excellent a leader in the in the area of parking studies, and so they w did all of the detailed parking inventories and counts and utilization studies for us. Then that resulted in the parking utilization uh, graphics that I have for you tonight. Then we also took a look at em employee parking and private parking and the role it could play. So since 1950, the city has embarked upon 10 different studies. Uh, there are three studies or proposals in progress. Those are not being done by the city right now, but by OCTA. Uh, the proposal is for the redevelopment of the Fox Block that would be in conjunction with the construction of another public parking structure for which the city currently has um, $6.2 million and is obligated to construct through an owner participation agreement with the Stephen Peck Trust. So that is in progress right now as well. And then six plans, um, including, as I said, the Fullerton Transportation Center specific plan. Um, so the findings among those studies, they're strikingly similar. Uh, generally speaking, they were to say that we need to provide for adequate transit rider parking. That's something that today we have capacity for for some increase, but it won't always be that way. And so continuing to understand how we continue to provide transit rider parking will continue to be important. To improve the occupancy of underutilized parking facilities, and when I show the maps that have the utilization um, statistics, you'll be able to identify that in some areas of the downtown. They're hot spots. They're always busy. Other areas are busy maybe at some times, and then other areas are not busy hardly at all. Um, to institute better management practices, to implement programs such as valet or shuttle service, and then in all cases to charge for parking. So looking at that first component, the existing striping signs and use of technology, uh, when we talk about how people interact with parking facilities, we, we call it having a system of graphic communication. And it's just as we see on the road. So when we're driving 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, we need to be able to understand as a driver what we're supposed to do within a very short amount of time. We don't have time to um, sort through a lot of text or multiple arrows or multiple colors. We want things to be consistent and simple and fast to understand. It's the same thing when someone goes to an area and they want to find public parking. They need a simple sign that looks the same everywhere. And in fact, you find cities throughout the, the, the world that have this type of public parking uh, supply that often you see, well, like on this report, there's a P in a circle. And most of us universally understand that means public parking. It's very common. So having that consistent graphic communication program is very important. We don't, we don't have that in the downtown as, those, as these um, signs are showing. And that 
goes along with the hourly restrictions are not consistent. They're arbitrary. They appear on a variety of signs, wayfinding and so forth. And then we, in parking talk, we say that first 30 feet is very important. So when I come up to a parking structure, it's dark, um, it's dirty, the signs are marred or broken or, or bent. Um, my first impression is that perhaps this is a place that's not going to be safe. <coughs> the information may be unreliable. Um, and that's, that's my first foot in the door when I arrive in downtown Fullerton and what perception and image does that provide. So that part of it is, is something that we noted could be improved. It also is that there's an absence of any printed maps or current online resources. And there's a huge opportunity to use a technology that's being used in other places, parking apps, for example, on your phone, a whole variety of parking technology that's available if the city went down the road of... Um, paid parking programs. The administration and management of the parking resources touch about four different departments in the city. For example, Public Works Department maintains the structures and the lots, but the structures are maintained by uh, the Building Facilities Division, and the surface lots are maintained by landscaping. So even within departments, there are um, areas where there isn't coordination or communication happening. Um, employee parking program is administered through public works, but the it was unknown that the yellow stripes, which mean employee parking, uh, were for that by the facilities division. So again, it's very dispersed among all these different departments, not necessarily coordinated well among them. So how much parking do we have downtown? There's a total of 5,716 spaces that are distributed throughout 24 parking lots, six parking structures, and then 1,684 curbside spaces as part of that total. And this map and all of this information is on the city website for, the, for this council meeting. And then we also have another website that will be live tomorrow, cityoffullerton.com downtown parking, backslash downtown parking, where you can also see this report. It's on a PDF. You can zoom in on this and, and look at those numbers to your heart's delight. And the, the parking structures, two of the six are incorporated into the Wilshire Promenade and City Point um, projects that is actually public parking that, that are a component of those structures. <coughs> the parking utilization study was based on a methodology that conducted counts between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. on a Thursday and then 11 to 1 on a Saturday. These were taken in July, which is a peak utilization for the downtown in the evening. We did supplemental counts this month for the plumber structure to understand how student parking was affecting that. And then we also performed uh, field inspections from July through now to continue to field verify those numbers and also did photo documentation in January of this year of all of the facilities. The study area itself was broken down into seven planning areas, which you can see on the map in the presentation. And these areas were determined um, by having them separated by uh, natural boundaries, such as a, a large street. So if I my destination is in planning area three, I want to park in planning area three. If I have to go to planning area four to park, I'm perceiving that it's too far away or it might be hard to find because I now have to cross a major street. So when someone is, is driving for uh, business or recreational purposes, they only want to walk about one or two blocks to get to their from their parking to their destination. If naturally, if they have a uh, better signage or some other incentive for them to park farther away and walk, they will. But that initial attempt is always going to be right. How close can I get? Which is why we circle the grocery store parking lot looking for the one right by the door when, you know, 10 feet farther away there's empty spaces. So that, that's a very normal driver behavior. So we wanted to understand where are the geographic areas and what are they separated by to understand then why do some areas feel full and other areas don't. So as I had said before, the parking counts on a whole found that there is enough parking overall, but as you'll see in the figures there are some uh, sectors, some of these planning areas that are constantly utilized. This is the weekday parking utilization for weekday at noon and weekday at 6. And these were the peak times within that nine-hour time period that the counts were performed every hour on the hour. So in this one, in planning area 4, you can see that large red triangle in the upper right-hand corner. 
that's the Plummer Auditorium structure, and that's student parking. It's almost 100% full all day during the school day. But then if you go over to weekday at 6 p.m., you can see now that it's gone to the yellow, 60% to 85% to utilized. And, and that's consistent with the number of classes in the late afternoon and evening dropping off. So you see the, the parking number freeing up there. If you go down to um, the planning area three, which is on the middle s segment on the left, the Amridge lots and the Wilshire Promenade lots are generally always full. And that one that's the north side of Amridge that's yellow, it was probably right at 85, maybe just didn't tip over into 86%, because that one generally from our field verifications is almost always full as well. And also during that time of the day, you can see in planning area um, four, I believe, is the transit area parking. And it's almost 100% utilized with the exception of the uh, FTC parking structure. And it's generally an underutilized resource in the evening. During the day, it's pretty full. Ms. Saluzzo? Yeah. You mentioned the Wilshire Promenade. <clears throat> and I had my office there for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And there is a subterranean parking in the middle of the day, you could roll a bowling ball through there because it is not utilized at all. Right. And yet the ground level parking space, a lot of the residents who should be parking below mm -hmm. are parking up there and taking up spaces for customers, employees of the building, et cetera, et cetera. Right. When you go through this, I would like you to, to take that into consideration and consider if there are any things that in anything that we can do to change that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll talk about a couple of things and then also about private parking. Yeah, as and, well. and I'm not asking you to address that tonight, but in as we go forward, if we go forward with this, mm -hmm. okay, definitely. Thank you. So this tells you this is the weekend parking utilization at weekend noon and then weekend midnight because our parking usage in the weekend at night peaks at about 11 to midnight. And you can see in that downtown core area at midnight, you see a lot of red there. And But then if you look up in the upper right for the plumber structure, again, it's green. Even when there are events at Plumber Auditorium, it's unusual for them to go much later than 10. So it tends to be a fairly underutilized resource at that time. And another thing that I think is interesting is, again, in that planning area that is uh, just to the bottom and to the right, that's planning area five. You see a red rectangle. That's the surface lot in near the transportation center. And then you see a green square just to the north of that. That's the Fullerton Transportation Center structure. And for a variety of reasons, folks don't like parking there. And so it's, it's an underutilized resource, even though everything around it's almost 100% occupied. We find the same thing there with the Wilshire structure. Um, you can see there it's yellow, but its service lot is red. In understanding the downtown core area, that those areas that are actually within that historic central business district that why they run so hot all the time why they're always red we wanted to understand what kinds of uh, businesses are open after 10 and we found that after 10 there are 45 businesses that advertise being open after 10 o'clock um, they're all restaurants and they ha they constitute um Again, there are, there are 45 of them within PA 3, 4, 5, and 6. So if we overlay the parking utilization with that, again, you can see a lot of red, very heavy, heavily utilized, including the SOCO structure, uh, which for transit use during the day still has some capacity, but on those weekend nights, it's very, very full. Um, but some un underutilized resources just a few blocks away, again, outside of that area where people feel like it's convenient to park. And they may not realize that those resources are there. So again, this is not meant to make any assessment or, or judgment about uses. It's just to say, where are the most heavily utilized resources and is there capacity nearby that could serve them? Then we looked at employee parking. Um, the employee parking program is established in 10 lots in the downtown. And in those lots, there are stalls that are striped in yellow. 
Um, there isn't any sign that says these are employee parking lots, but on the parking permit you can get from the city, it says that employee parking is allowed within these yellow striped stalls in excess of whatever the posted hours are. So if you have an employee hang tag and it's a three-hour limited parking in that lot, you may park there as long as you need to for your job. The, there's a cost per each of these permits for $6 for the year, and in 2015, we issued 826 of them. There are 721 striped employee parking spaces. 53% of the parking stalls in the study area are striped for employee parking. The most desirable lots, those Amridge lots, for example, the Wilshire lot next to the Wilshire um, parking structure, have more than 60% of their spaces striped for employee parking. So this is probably different from what you would want for your most desirable lots. You typically want to incentivize turnover in those lots for your short-term parkers. Um, so we did want to understand, was there available supply nearby that could take the place of some of those shorter lots if that was something the council wanted to explore, which we do often get complaints about the lack of availability of short-term daytime parking for uh, visitors, um, business meetings, restaurants at lunchtime, and that kind of thing. So if we look particularly at the Wilshire structure, and that's the large um, box that you see up the upper left-hand side that has the, t the statistics in it, that box is showing you per floor what the utilization is. So we see that basement level, the first floor, it's used all day, and it's, it's uh, striped for 100% for employee parking. Then the top level is striped for 85% employee parking, and it's uh, very underutilized at most times of the day and night. It's, it's green. So there is supply nearby that could be used to create more short-term parking. Then another very underutilized resource that's downtown is private parking, and it's common to not look at private parking because that's not land that the city can control. However, through a parking management district, that could be a tool that people who own private parking lots, should they wish to join voluntarily, could potentially generate revenue for themselves by including these lots in the system. They would be a good resource for valet lots in particular. So if we go to the next slide, I'm sorry, that utilization figure is not in this presentation, but it is in the report. We will see that there are many lots, the private lots, they're green all the time, and they're immediately adjacent to our most utilized public lots. So it would be very interesting to see how those could be incorporated into the supply to augment the existing parking that we have and thereby also avoid the need to you know, construct or consider purchasing land for new parking. So in, in summary, and some of the conclusions here, again, I think one of the most important conclusions is that uh, we did not find that there is a need to develop new parking resources uh, based just on existing supply that is there and existing in future demand, as well as the policy implications of purchasing land, um, removing what is there, and creating more parking. It's very expensive, and at some point, you end up with all parking lots and no businesses to visit. Um, the primary finding of the report it really is that the system itself requires uh, the establishment of a funding and management program to ensure its long-term success. And also because there's a quite of an impact to the city general fund right now, there's no uh, user fee, essentially, for the use of this public parking. So we recommend that, this, that the council direct us to create the phase two implementation framework for the Downtown Fullerton Parking Management Strategic Plan. And the components of this would be that we develop an organizational structure and staffing plan to provide a single point of coordination for everything relating to the parking system. And then renew the effort to establish both a parking management district and a business improvement district in order to create funding sources and a resource management structure to fund operations, maintenance, and policing of the lots and structures, but to also fund business programs that will benefit all downtown property and business owners. This would, of course, include a large outreach component to it. And we would uh, recommend also that this be brought back to you within six months so that you could have a, a sense of when this will return and that we go ahead and make some progress on this. That concludes my report. Great, thanks so much. Are there some council questions for Director Haluza before we open it up to public comment? No. 
Seeing none, if there are any members of the public who'd like to speak on this item, please come forward. Thanks. First speaker, please. Teresa Harvey, President and CEO of the North Orange County Chamber of Commerce. I just want to commend staff on its work and its progress on this project. As a business that's located in the downtown, we see the critical um, shifts that happen during parking during the day. I know that the structure that's most convenient for us and that our employees quite often park in is also the closest city parking structure to the community college, and so we do get a lot of overflow from that students who would rather park in that parking lot than to pay for parking, and they can get two hours of free parking there. We also know that a lot of the lots in the downtown have the most convenient parking to the businesses designated as, um, just as Karen said, as employee parking, so that employees take the spots that are most directly adjacent to the businesses. That always has seemed to me as something that's a little upside down. But I think it's the, as the popularity of our city continues to grow and the numbers of visitors and residents increase that it's critical to have a plan in place. It's important to know where the signage is, where the parking lots are, especially if people are coming from in from out of town. Um, as the existing plan found, there's sufficient parking and with the proper tools, we can direct people and to charge appropriately where, where the council might direct to make sure that we can manage it. I know one of the greatest frustrations that we have is when we call the police department and pull them off of other much more important issues to come and chalk the tires in the, in the parking lot because people are overextending their time. So if we could create some solutions to that problem, I think it would be most helpful. Thank you for accepting the staff's direction to move forward on this project. Thanks so much. Next speaker. like to talk about the idea of a business improvement district, um, mainly because this was something that um, was broached in the past by a redevelopment agency. There was redevelopment funding used. What I understand from business improvement district is that it has to be brought about by the, um, the people who will be taxed, the people who will be managing it, running it. Um, so it does seem a bit inappropriate um, to be pursuing this from a planning perspective. But um, if you do intend to do this, I just would like to um, suggest a different plan than was proposed before. Before, there was a plan um, that was um, property-based as opposed to usage-based. And as you know, in a business improvement district, the votes are weighted up based on how much property you own. So what ended up happening, or would have ended up happening in this plan, was the small businesses in the downtown area actually became very unfortunate for them would be taxed for usages that they weren't really creating an issue. This was proposed as a way to deal with the problems downtown with the bars. The bar problems have been going on that long back when we had redevelopment still. So I would like to recommend that if you do choose to pursue this that you pursue a usage based and make it specifically for the bars um, because we do want to encourage our, our businesses. We don't want our daytime businesses that do legitimate business to be driven away by additional, because essentially be taxes on their, pro on their property tax bill to pay for this business improvement district. So um, since much of the maintenance of our um, the structures downtown are based on vomit um, and but other bodily excrements, uh, after I went to the uh, museum center opening uh, last weekend, I had to tiptoe through some young woman's urine that ran into a little pool outside of my passenger side door. Um, so uh, I, I would just like to encourage you to consider usage, make it based on bar usage, and uh, protect our daytime legitimate businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. David Curley. Uh, comment on a couple things with the study uh, that are a little concerning. The, the study ap appears to have only studied a, a Thursday and a Saturday in, I guess it was last July. Um, I think if there was a statistics professor around here, they'd probably have a heart attack because of the small sample size. Um, what happens on a Thursday or what happens uh, on a Saturday is not necessarily indicative of what happens the rest of the week. Um, that Saturday, um, there could have been an Angels game going on, and that could have affected, I mean, people staying home. Or maybe they were uh, parking downtown and riding the train 
to an Angels game. I don't know. The weather could have been strange. I guess the point I'm getting at is that the, I think the conclusions about the use of those parking facilities from that study should be taken loosely. Um, if for no other reason, there could be tallying uh, errors. I mean, just inadvertent errors when you tally up the counts. If you only do it on uh, one weekday and one weekend day, you're not going to have, you, you're not necessarily going to have um, accuracy if, if errors creep up. Um, I noticed the Plummer Auditorium structure, the counts there, uh, I believe the counts were conducted at 12 noon and 6 p.m. Um, I went to Fullerton College and I don't remember any class that was in session at 12 or 6. There may have been a 4, 4 to 7 p.m. class, but almost everyone is gone at those times, so I'm not sure those counts uh, really hold up. Um, so I have a question, maybe Ms. Halusa can answer this. Um, in the agenda letter, it says, any decision to form a district will be dependent upon a vote of those within the, within the district. Uh, does that apply to the parking management district, the business improvement district, or both? Because I think both are mentioned in the same paragraph. It's not clear um, what that applies to. Uh, I just want to close by saying uh, something about Metrolink. Uh, Fullerton is, is the second busiest Metrolink station in the system. Um, what's not uh, represented by the counts that Metrolink publishes is that on the Orange County line, there's a partnership with Amtrak allowing uh, Metrolink monthly pass holders to ride Amtrak, which many do because it's a nicer train and they have food service and everything. And they also will take later trains back from if they work in downtown LA or if they work in South County. And it, many of them will come back after 9 p.m. And I think 9 p.m. was floated uh, here at some point about a time to start paid parking. So you would discourage those riders because they wouldn't be able to park. I mean, if they don't know their schedule and uh, would have to work late, they might be hit with paid parking. So keep that in mind uh, going forward. I don't like the idea of paid parking, but I realize it's not my call, but give that some thought. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Thank you, Sean Payton. I, a couple, just a couple minor things. Uh, well, not minor, but small. Um, it, there's two concerns I have with the plan. One is again the par use of parking fees. Uh, the other one is the parking management district. Just to remind you, this came up on the college town, the, and the planning commission was very negative about a parking management district. So I don't think it really is something that the city can force on. Uh, the community, if the community decides they want to create it, I think that would be up to them. For us to get involved, it's another level of bureaucracy, another level of government. Uh, and again, the Planning Commission was very sour on that idea when it came to College Town. Uh, on the parking fees, just, just one thing to point out. Um, the parking structure on uh, Santa Fe and uh, Chapman, where a lot of people use if they're going to the bars, uh, if, if you make that paid parking, what you're going to do is you're encourage cheapskates to look for free parking in the nearby residences. So, and that, we got to keep that in mind. I mean, the reason we built that was because the, the single-family homeowners that live adjacent to the downtown area were complaining day and night. I know they were complaining because when I walked neighborhoods, they were complaining to me. So I know they've complained to you. And I, I know Judith Caluzzi mentioned that many times when uh, – because she lives right near that area, about how you would have people that would look for free parking, park in the residential, and then stagger back to the car completely drunk at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, when we charge people, they're going to park more away from those spots, which is exactly what we don't want to do to the residents there. So something just to keep in mind while we're doing our planning. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, Vince Buck. Uh, I first became interested in the downtown parking back when uh, the Ambridge Court project was proposed because we had a shortage of parking, so we needed to build that structure. 
which we haven't done yet. Um, but I went, uh, went around looking, and uh, as, as did some other people, and, and there did not seem to be a shortage of parking at that time. And if there were a shor shortage of parking, then it could be resolved by policy changes like charging for parking and, 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 and restricting more, some restrictions on the um, employee parking. Uh, there, 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 were, there were answers without getting into involved in a huge project, uh, be that as it may. I think this is an excellent study. I would emphasize two points. I, I think moving the employee parking away from the desirable areas uh, is, is important. I, I think if you, if you don't, uh, you know, people who own shopping malls, they don't let the employees park right in front of the main door. They, they, they park elsewhere so people can move in and out. Um, having them park as they do it probably de 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 um, deters some business. And the other is I, I think uh, charging for the most popular lots is, is, is something we should look into and, and, and consider. Not, not necessarily all the lots, but those that, that are filled most often, the, the average lots in particular, um, um, charging for parking is probably a wise idea. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Next, is, are there any other public speakers? to see you guys <clears throat> um, a lot of really good points have been brought up tonight and um, I would I there's a lot of uh, well first of all Jeremy Popoff I own the slide bar in downtown Fullerton I also own commercial property in downtown Fullerton so as a business owner and a commercial property owner down there I am a big fan of the business improvement district as well as um, the paid parking um, we, we need a lot of help down there, and I think this is a first step in, in, in that direction. Um, and, you know, um, Ms. Flory mentioned something earlier about the uh, parking structure, and about I think, I think a big problem that we have is just people parking in the wrong areas. So residents aren't parking where they're supposed to park, commuters aren't parking where they're supposed to park, and as a result, businesses suffer. So my parking lot uh, is a straight shot to the train station. And as a, if you're going to hop on the train, it's more desirable for you to park in front of the slide bar than it is to park in the structure. But then that hurts my business. It hurts uh, my customers don't have anywhere to park. And that happens a lot. You could come to Hopscotch, Bourbon Street, Slide Bar, Stubricks, 4 o'clock on a Wednesday, and everybody is a ghost town, but there's nowhere to park. And that's because it's all, they're all on the train. And um, our customers and our employees don't necessarily want to park in the structure either because it's a, a kind of an undesir undesirable walk through several other lots and um, I think we need help in maintaining those lots and so I think there'll be some accountability and some uh, um, clarity as to whose job it is to maintain what lots and and all that so um, we've been kind of crying for help um, several of the uh, of my fellow restaurant owners in downtown all are uh, in favor of the uh, business Improvement District and the paid parking. We're all big fans of both ideas, and uh, we're all more than happy to sit down and, and discuss it further, but I just wanted to, you know, show my support. I think it's a great idea. Thanks. Thank you so much. Are there any other public speakers on this item? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and bring it back. Um, and Director Haluza, I would ask um, if you have any, res if you feel the need to respond to any of the public comments that were brought up. Yeah, sure, just real briefly. On the study methodology, uh, this is a common study methodology. Uh, you don't typically go out and do parking counts on multiple days for many periods of time. However, um, as I said, there was uh, parking counts that were done on a weekday and a weekend at a representative time period when it was known that this was going to be peak parking time as well as supplemental counts during the school year, as well as probably weekly field checks between July and now, in addition to the uh, detailed photographic documentation that was done in January. And um, yeah. Well, my and it's my understanding that this, that you're just referring to the most updated study, because how many studies oh. again have been done on this? Yeah, absolutely. The, there, everyone has basically found that this is the pattern, that this is the case. So I, I stand behind the methodology, and I think that it is accurate. Um, as far as unintended consequences of paying for parking, absolutely. That is why we've not recommended doing paid parking right now. There would be some, a lot of work more to be done because you absolutely only want to, if you do a paid parking program, you, you want it to be smart. You want it to achieve the goals you hope for it to achieve. 
Um, and that's something that would require a lot more filling out and a lot more direction from the council as well. So those comments are well noted. Great, thanks. Um, as we get into this discussion uh, as a council, I wonder if we could split the two uh, recommendations of staff and if I could get a motion uh, just on the first to receive and file the Downtown Fullerton Parking Management Strategic Plan I'll, I'll Phase 1. I'll move that one. we receive and file the Downtown Fullerton Parking Management Strategic Plan. I'll second. Great. Is there any f other f further discussion on that item alone? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, great. And then I think, Mayor Pro Tem Flora, you look like you're ready to Poised say something. Poised to say something? You do. Well, I thought I ought to weigh in here and read into the record Mike Rito's comments. He sent us all an email. He is the president of the Fullerton Downtown Business Association. And in short, he writes, all of us in downtown Fullerton are interested in any possible solutions to the parking issue. And it is my understanding that some would be in favor of paid parking at certain times in heavy traffic areas, plus a new look at the BID, Business Improvement District, is on our radar as well. Uh, Mike Rito's office is above Joey's, which is between Commonwealth and Heroes, and uh, he, has, he has his pulse on what's going on downtown. I think it only makes sense to direct staff to initiate Phase 2, which is the plan and implementation framework, we need to see where this is going. This has been an ongoing pro problem for a long time, and it's time to grapple with it. I am uh, confident that staff will receive a lot of, of, of comment from the business community, from the educational institutions that are going to be affected, and I think this can only help our situation. Thank you. Was I'm sorry, was that a motion that you made? Uh, I'll, I'll move. Item number two, which is direct staff to initiate phase two of the strategic plan Thanks. and framework. For the sake of discussion, I'll go ahead and second that. And then, Mr. Chafee, did you have comments? Oh, I did have a few. First, I want to commend staff on doing a very thorough job and appreciate this is really just the beginning. Uh, I remember days in the past we had parking meters. Those were gone, but uh, paid parking in the downtown does have a precedent in the past. I don't know where it should be implemented or how much or any of those things, but it is not uh, actually new. I like the idea particularly of trying to combine uh, public with private spaces so you can uh, do a more integrated plan of the, of the parking. Um, I am a little concerned about the business improvement district. That's not something we would impose. Rather, typically they're created by business people coming to the city and saying we want to do this. Uh, what's missing here uh, to me uh, before that goes further and I would look to the people like uh, Jeremy Poffoff and maybe Mike Rito to kind of flesh this out if we're going to consider that. Uh, what is the boundary? Where is that going to be? Who's going to be in it? What is it going to do? And what's it going to cost the members that are part of it? And uh, so I, I think for now I see staff's focus on, on the uh, parking. Uh, that needs that's what we can do and be up to the business community I think to come forward if they want to initiate a business improvement district But I would like staff since this has been a critical issue for so long to continue Especially on the parking aspects of it. So I do support this as it as it is and again uh, Thank you for doing an excellent job mm -hmm. And in fact, I do think I mean, I know that uh, business community members from the downtown have come to me personally. We've had people come publicly, Jeremy, just tonight. So I wonder, Director Haluza, if you could clarify a little bit um, the process for a business improvement district. The experience I have with them, I haven't gone all the way through a formation, but I do have experience in their formation, is that it's a partnership. Um, the, the, there's a taxing component to this that has to be administered by the government, by the city. And it's typically the case where a city would be approached by a business association to partner with them to assist in the establishment and the formation of it. So I would see this as, as a joint effort. Okay, thanks. Mr. Whitaker, do you have comments? Yeah, I, I differ very much uh, in the take on this because I believe that Fullerton is blessed over the decades decisions that were made to create ample free parking throughout the downtown area. And this uh, report, I think a fair reading of this report, indicates that there really is no problem, that uh, even during a peak time when this was uh, monitored, 
that there were relatively few hot spots, and there generally seemed to be throughout the report uh, an acceptance that there is ample parking. It, some of the other, uh, and I'll take issue with certain other things in the report, but generally I, I think it's, it's a good report, and if it's interpreted properly, I don't understand why we would be interested in the unnecessary creation of a separate bureaucracy and the costs included with that the unnecessary regime of creating a, an environment of possible citations and charges, creating hazards for people who are visiting our city or conducting business here, and the unnecessary complication of the current regime which we have in the city, which is ample free parking. Uh, we're all customers. We all attend events and travel to different cities, and it's a gauge of friendliness when there is a public asset free city parking provided throughout various attractions, including our museum center and others. I see it as analogous to city parks. The question of whether there should be user fees or not, we would never consider that for a city park. Certainly ample parking needs to be provided at city parks as well. But I had a couple questions of clarifications before I go any further, uh, Ms. Halusa. I was, um, I need clarification on the inventory here which was taken because I note that on uh, page 35 of the report that it indicated off-street parking supply which included surface lot spaces and garage structure spaces and those totaled uh, 4,032 if you're with me on that and at the bottom the on-street parking supply in this area was 1,684 spaces correct so I noticed earlier in the presentation that you had indicated 5,716 spaces, which would be the sum of those two. But elsewhere in the report, it indicated, and I almost thought that I uh, must be becoming dyslexic or something because it's 5,176 spaces are indicated elsewhere in the report. The same numbers just scrambled a little bit. It's possible that I was dyslexic. So the, the numbers that, that you see on page 35 are correct, and I'll go back and double check the other. So it is the larger number. I believe that it is, yes. F philosophically, the problem that I have is, and it's important, I want to call attention to the fact, an important fact, that the city does not own these parking spaces, that the public owns them, that we have purchased them, that they are part of the city's asset base. They're already paid for. They are a resource that all of us as citizens, businesses, and visitors to the city uh, can use. There, there's no ongoing charge for the acquisition of such. In fact, the report indicates that we have ample parking into the foreseeable future, and future development would require adequate parking to be provided for those developments. So it, y we're entering into something to solve a problem where no problem really exists, in my opinion. One of the problems is that if the city creates a single uh, management structure for all the parking within the city, is that the city is the regulator of this public resource and should not have a profit interest in parking charges. And let me indicate just how severe that would be. In here it talked about an ample subsidy and indicated that there was a large subsidy paid by everyone in the city for those who don't utilize downtown parking. Now, there may be some people in the city that never utilize downtown parking, but I would hazard to guess that most of us do at, at one point or another. Now that I've got clarification on that number, I used the smaller number earlier, and the costs for the city to maintain uh, is listed in this report. Each parking space per day is 19 cents at the sm a smaller number. So now we're probably talking 17 cents per day is the cost to maintain this free parking. It's not a huge number when you look at the city budget. It's a little bit over $300,000 total for those 5,716 spaces. I would argue that that is a very efficient allocation of current expenditures. One of my concerns is that when we do start managing this resource in such a way, and the idea is to change human behavior and move people around. I agree that if you were going to impose 
this structure that you would want to find the real choke points on traffic and maybe at the later hours and try to radiate out from there and get people to walk a little bit further to utilize the underutilized spaces or structures. But the problem was uh, outlined earlier by a speaker that that starts a radiation away from the downtown area and drives many people seeking to avoid the complications or perhaps the legal hazards of parking in a limited uh, condition parking spot out into neighborhoods, further exacerbating the problems as we've seen at uh, Cal State Fullerton or at Fullerton College. So to me, it, it makes little sense to try to fix something that's not broken. And imagine that, if the, actual, if the city's actual cost, if the internal subsidy of each parking space is something on the order of 17 cents per day, Imagine what kind of a parking regime would be created that would not just be uh, a boon profit-wise for the city. This, this entire uh, approach is indicated uh, for revenue generation. But the problem with that is, in so many other municipalities where this is done, it discourages the very utilization that they're counting on, a little bit like mass transit sometimes where you project a certain amount of usage and a certain amount of revenue, you build the bureaucracy or the management structure to control that. You're actually applying large layers of cost to something that really has no cost right now. You're creating sharp corners for everybody who deals with our parking downtown. When, when I was mayor and helped to open the uh, SoCo structure, I reveled in the fact that all this free parking was available that it was outside funding predominantly for the city. And again, another excellent resource for the entire downtown area. So the, uh, the concerns that I have are many. And the uh, one additional concern, as we create violations and violators, which don't exist now because we have largely free and unfettered parking, especially in the evening hours downtown, you're diverting police and city employee attention and labor costs and everything into parking management. You're actually creating more cost that currently doesn't exist. And the cost for law enforcement and for other city employees to actively manage these violations and potential violators of, of all the parking, uh, which would now be restricted downtown, will far exceed any amount of revenue that's going to be collected for this parking. So to me, this is an exercise in futility. And I will be interested in seeing with the next installment just how this pencils out. Because I used to be in retail management. And one of the most powerful words in the English language, two words, is free parking. And I don't understand why we would change that in downtown Fullerton. Uh, if we did want to pursue changing and, and relinquishing some of these city assets, they should be sold to private operators. Private operators could work with the marketplace. And if there is a market for higher price valet parking in certain central city areas, that's the way it should be done. It should be done by a private operator. But as long as the city wants to create this apparatus for a complete control and top down, uh, I'm concerned about where that leads us because it starts managing scarcity and creating scarcity. It's a little bit like uh, the County of Orange back when, when the express lanes for the 91 freeway were created. They went to an outside source, the Diamond Group, and they sold that. They privatized the express lane. But then a little bit later, when they were looking to expand the 91 freeway to accommodate population growth and traffic growth, they found now that the operator that had a dedicated profit on that w could prevent that, could prohibit that. So you start, you start wading into irrational areas which are aimed at only milking the maximum profit out of something, and it's self-defeating. The actions that you take reduce. They actually create more problems. They create many more layers of cost to oversee and manage it. And you wind up uh, creating no revenue. It's the question I asked earlier about plumber the only structure in the city which currently charges for parking. And it generates zero revenue for the city. And so that would be my prediction for this plan. And I look forward with interest to see if uh, fellow council members are willing to head down that path. 
but it's very clear to me uh, where this leads us. As far as a business improvement district, that's up to the business operators to propose such and bring it to us and, and we'll look at that. But the creation of all these layers of costs is something that I think is easily overlooked, but we really need to be clear-eyed about this. Mr. Seaborn? Um, well, a lot's been said, and I agree with much of what I've heard. Um, you know, my concern is that uh, during the day, when you go in and you visit a lot of the restaurants and the shops, um, they uh, they they are emptier than I anticipated that they would be. I thought it was uh, a lot of these places were busier during the weekday, and um, I can see putting in paid parking as being very harmful to almost all of these businesses, which is why I wouldn't support uh, paid parking during daytime hours. But I think when we get into the Thursday night, Saturday night, Friday night rush that occurs in our downtown, I think there is um, the ability to have paid parking and be able to collect um, a reasonable fee for that to support the maintenance of those parking areas, which uh, includes a lot of uh, um, re-signing, re-striping, uh, actually managing it, meaning putting the employees in a designated area that makes sense for employees to park, um, being able to have patrons have the closer parking, commuters need to be, um, you know, in, in the other parking and um, be able to have it so so that the patrons can, or the business owners, can really control their destiny. I mean, it comes down to local control and having them be able to have a say in how it's done. Right now, they really don't have a say. It is free parking, and it is a free-for-all. And so oftentimes, the free-for-all means that they get hurt, and uh, it means you don't get the best parking. If I want to run into um, one of the restaurants for a quick lunch, I'll either have to valet somewhere or park far and walk because of the uh, the various employees and and you know others that are using the the nearby parking. So I think there is a value there, especially in the evenings. And I think you have businesses, uh, particularly the nightclubs uh, and some of the, the the restaurants that are willing to um, help chip in uh, to whatever extent that is, whether it be with uh, brains or brawn or, or finance, to to be able to help make this successful. Um, I would like to see what the next step looks like. I would like to see how the numbers pan out, um, and I am cautiously optimistic. Yeah, Mr. Chafee? Yeah, just a couple more comments. This is not intended to be a revenue-generating venture at all. The rates, I assume, will be set here by the Council, and it mainly pays for some of our current costs, including public safety. I think that's part of what uh, the reason here is. I uh, further thought, I'd, I hope, uh, staff can explore a transit or jitney service that connects these parking structures that might answer a lot of the, the uh, d uh, questions about why some spaces are not used and others are overused and then last uh, thinking of my uh, ancient memory here when i remember parking meters were installed it took pennies and nickels mm -hmm. for a penny you could get 12 minutes for nickel you get a whole hour if you needed it so uh, anyway, I don't think our rates would be anything like that. But uh, I thank again, thank staff for its uh, insight here. Great, and I just I want to thank Karen as well for uh, the report that we have before us. I think it, uh, along with all the other studies that have been done in this area, uh, gives us a good foundation to work with. Uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions right now. Um, and going to uh, a phase two, um, it, I, it's my hope that those questions will be answered. Um, I think we, uh, it, it's irresponsible for us to not manage well the public assets that we have. And I'm struck by um, the lack of organization right now uh, with these public assets uh, of parking. So I'm eager to, eager to see what phase two, um, what that implementation plan would look like and uh, we'll, I'm sure it will be heartily debated at that point as well. So, I had a, just a quick question for uh, Ms. Luza. Uh, did the, did the uh, California uh, Department of Finance, uh, when they were looking at a property management plan, were, were there comments regarding our parking and having a parking plan or parking management plan? No, that wasn't anything that they were interested in looking so at. They held up that entire process for, what, a couple of years, and they didn't even 
point out our parking <laughs> issues. All right, thanks. And just a comment, I, I did make this motion. Fullerton is becoming a destination city, particularly on our Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. And I dare say there are very few destinations in Orange County where you go to that you do not pay for parking. In my own personal experience, I pay for parking at the courthouse about three times a week. If I want to go to the beach, I have to pay for parking. Uh, Disneyland's population doesn't seem to be decreasing, and they charge an arm and a leg for parking, as does Angel Stadium. So I think it makes sense that our parking structures should at least support the maintenance. I don't envision staff coming back with a permanent parking um, a parking charge for all parking at all times of the day and night. But I also think that staff did a yeoman's job in preparing this parking report. Um, I know from having my office down in, in Fullerton, downtown, for 12 years, that there were many times that I would come home from court and could not park in the Wilshire Promenade at all. Every time I want to go down to Bourbon Street, sorry, Jeremy, <laughs> You can't find a parking spot, so I dump my husband off because he's, you know, not moving around the landscape that well these days. Drop him off, and a lot of times I have to park at the end of where the train uh, station parking is and then hoof it a couple of blocks back to the restaurant. So the employee situation is an issue. If any of you go to Ace Hardware, if you happen to be on the city council, you will hear from Michael every single time you go in there about his disgruntlement over the fact that the beauty salon or this business or that business, the employees are all taking up his customers' parking, what he views as his parking because his customers can't park. So I think that this uh, next phase of the impl implementation plan is very, very important, and I support it wholeheartedly. Right. We do have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay, and now we'll move on to item number 12. If I could, Mayor Fitzgerald, there was, it was a three-part recommendation on the first page of the agenda letter. Uh, and yes, I'll, I'll make the which is to direct staff to renew efforts to establish a parking management district and or a business improvement district. And I would not expect that staff will be going off on its own hook, but rather will be soliciting the business community to come forward and be a partner in that effort. I view the city as more of a facilitator than anything else. Yeah, I would second that. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay, now we'll move on to item number 12. Good evening, Mayor Fitzgerald and members of council. I'm Gretchen Beatty, Director of Human Resources. The item I bring to you tonight is first consideration of a tentative agreement with one of our bargaining units, the Fullerton Firefighters Association. I have a short PowerPoint presentation that should look fairly fami familiar to you at this point as it's the format I've used for several tentative agreements recently brought to you for consideration. We began negotiations with this group, which represents approximately 80 employees, primarily in the classifications of firefighter, fire engineer, and fire captain, but also represents a few firefighter trainees and non-sworn technical positions, uh, such as hazmat inspectors and fire inspectors. We began dis discussing negotiation, negotiating with this group in May of 2015 and reached a tentative agreement in January of 2016. There was a series of exchange of proposals with the group between the group and the city during that time period and, and rejected proposals were posted on the website under the labor negotiations tab as required under our ordinance 3213. 
We reached tentative agreement with the group on January 22nd, uh, just recently, and posted the tentative agreement online on February the 9th, seven days prior to tonight, in accordance with our ordinance. Tonight, we'll have first review, and we'll bring it back to you upon your instructions um, and under Ordinance 3213 for further consideration, final consideration at the next meeting, March 1st. This slide shows a little bit of history about negotiations with this group. We, um, as we looked at with the prior, uh, with earlier groups when we brought tentative agreements, this group in 2008-2009 through the period 2010-11 received no salary increases, resulting in a no budget increase but flat budget changes other than those that were caused by um, increases to health insurance and CalPERS, etc. In 2011, 2012, and 2012 13, we negotiated with this group uh, increases in cost sharing on their CalPERS. Their CalPERS employee cost sharing went from 2.55% to the current 9.55%. This was a reduction in the um, previously anticipated CalPERS cost to the city. In 2013-14 and 2014-15, again, there were no salary increases, but there were limited rebates negotiated with this group, similar to with other groups, in the amount of 1% each year, which equ equal to a one-time impact to the budget of $202,000, not continuing past the, the final year of the agreement. The current proposed agreement for which we've reached tentative agreement with the unit uh, will have a two-year term beginning in 2015-16, the current year. So we're looking back to July 1, 2015, going forward to 16-17, July, uh, June 30, 2017. The first year of the agreement includes a proposal for a 5% across the board salary increase, which will have an, a resultant increase to the budget for the current year of $706,273. For the second year of the agreement, there's a 4% proposed salary increase with an impact to the budget of $1.253,548. In the 1617 cost increases um, do not include the 2.5. In addition to those, there's also a $392,899 cost not related to changes negotiated with this group. These would be related primarily to the CalPERS cost increases that are anticipated for 1617 or known for 1617 at this point. The primary terms of the tentative agreement include the term that I just spoke with, the two-year, across-the-board increases, as I mentioned. We have a re-opener included in the terms that re allow us to discuss with this group the potential for a fire service merger with the city of Brea and also a um, separate reopener under the same provision, but the ability to reopen should we have changes under the Affordable Care Act that required uh, additional discussion. We have negotiated the addition of a seventh position for the urban search and rescue assignments to be made by the fire chief. We have updated language to for FLSA, that's the Fair Labor Standards Act, and provisions related to um, appropriate, appropriate application of the, this federal law. And we have updated the list of uh, safety equipment, safety gear that we provide to the, the members of this unit. We have also updated under the CalPERS sections the same updates you've seen on the, the uh, previous agreements where we are implementing or including now the changes required under PEPRA, the Public Employees Pension Reform Act, as well as previously negotiated uh, changes to our, our local agreement with CalPERS for changes that went, uh, went into effect in 2012. With this group, we have negotiated a medical insurance contribution change. We're switching from a 50-50 split of premium increases to a split where the city picks up 40% of the increase and the employee picks up 60%. Under a provision regarding tobacco use, we are uh, deleting an unenforceable provision regarding off-work use. And we are increasing the initial probation uh, period for non-sworn positions. Those are the 
technical positions in the fire prevention unit from the current six months to one year. This one year period is equivalent to that for that has been in place for the sworn employees for an, a, a number of years. And in, in addition, it's necessary to in, ensure that new employees in these positions get the training necessary uh, during the term of their initial probation. And besides that, we have some miscellaneous updates, language changes, and clarifications throughout the document. Our recommendation this evening is that you give first consideration to the tentative agreement and direct staff to return for final consideration on March 1st. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director Beatty. Um, does the council have any questions? I, I would just like to clarify something. Uh, thank you, Gretchen, for that. The, um, when we talk in terms of X number of years that any um, bargaining group hasn't received raises, that really isn't taking into account uh, salary step increases, which are automatic for many employees. It, uh, it also doesn't take into account promotions or changes in rank or, or uh, status by those employees as well, right? That is correct. You did indicate the rebate which occurred, which also gets classed as not a raise as well, but it was another cost item on behalf of the city. Uh, and I appreciated that you had separated out the automatic increases in the cost of maintaining a guaranteed benefit pension for members of this group. And you had a $393,000 annual cost, which is in effect a raise of a sort that the city needs to fund to live up to its, its uh, promise to be able to uh, provide a uh, 3 at 50 uh, guaranteed pension benefit. So I just wanted to clarify that when we make that broad statement of no raises for X number of years, that that isn't the complete story. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Director Beatty. Is there any member of the public who would like to address this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council. Uh, under our ordinance, this is just a, a first reading, a receive and file item. This will come back for final action in two weeks. Um, do I have a motion? Yeah, I move to receive and file the tentative agreement for first review. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Yes, one final comment. With this proposal, this council majority has not addressed nor stemmed the unsustainable benefits costs that we're facing, that municipalities throughout the state of California is facing. I'm concerned that the level of increases far exceeds the current inflation rate as I've mentioned before, Social Security recipients have received zero as a um, cost of living adjustment this year. So in my opinion, these levels are unsustainable. I think we all, certainly as property owners uh, in the city of Fullerton, appreciate a professional, well-functioning fire agency. And this is meant as no disrespect, but if anyone cares to um, reflect upon the current level of salaries, which is uh, typical of firefighters throughout the state of California, um, there needs to be a change. We need to do something to gain control of these costs. And I regret that the council majority uh, doesn't understand this pressing need. Mr. Seaborn, did you have a comment? No, I just wanted to add um, w one more thought to that, and that is um, I had some serious disagreements, and this has been the case all along with all of these negotiations on many of the assumptions on revenue sources and the amount of revenue. And um, it was very speculative, and I didn't like that. I wanted to base our numbers more on reality so that in a couple of years when the recession bubble hits and we're all sucking wind, uh, we're able to still pay and not have to uh, ask for uh, employees to take it on the chin and, and take a cut in pay. Thank you. Are there any further comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay. That takes us through our agenda. And um, I want to thank again staff for the great work on all the items tonight. Uh, really appreciate all the work you put in every day. And then as we adjourn tonight, um, if you, we're going to adjourn in the memory of uh, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. And if you notice, our flags are flying at half mast um, to honor his life. So let's just take a moment of silence to remember him. 
Thank you. This meeting's adjourned.